<clears throat> I want to talk about false prophets today. Who are they? Who are false prophets? How do we identify them? What do we look for in them? I mean, what's that identifying mark that's going to teach us biblically that this person is a false prophet? So I see this. It comes up um, in the letter that Matthew's writing, Matthew uh, chapter 7, verse 15. There's this line, uh, and he writes, and this is Jesus speaking, of course. He says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. So who are these false prophets? Now, I've been called a false prophet before. Um, and interestingly enough, I think the people who have uh, labeled me as such are, in fact, oftentimes themselves false prophets. But the reasons why we view each other as a false prophet are completely different. Um, I have been labeled a false prophet because perhaps someone doesn't agree with the interpretation I might have of a parable or of a specific verse. And we're not talking about salvation verses um, necessarily. We're just talking about in general, the scripture, I might be writing something on tithing and I have my view and they'll say, ah, false prophet. And I think it's like, hey, I called you a false prophet. That means I win and you lose. That's all I have to do is pull the false prophet card. And so unfortunately, like many other scriptures, people will pull things out of context. We find a verse and we say, oh, it'll sound good if I cite this. Uh, and it'll automatically make me the winner in such a debate. So where does this come from? So this is Matthew's letter. And again, it's uh, chapter 7, verse 15, where he's warning us to watch out for these false prophets. And I think in order to discover exactly who these people are, we really need to back up just two verses and we need to read verses 13 and 14. But before I read that, I want to give you a little bit of context. If you read Matthew, uh, Matthew's letter, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the cross doesn't really happen uh, until the end of those letters, right? And they're basically all just given their own uh, individual accounts. But what do we see as the audience? Who are Who is being addressed in these letters? Just use Matthew's letter for now. Is it, say, a bunch of God-loving, Jesus-following Christians? Or is it a bunch of Jewish people? Because that matters. And first of all, I think we can agree that, well, they're writing Jewish people, right? These are all Jewish people that, I'm not saying there's any no, no non-Jewish people in there, but by and large, they're Jewish people. Now, what do we know about these Jewish people? For when it comes to salvation and inheriting the kingdom, are they a all chasing after Jesus as a general rule? They chasing after Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the he's the Son of God. He is the Savior of the world here to rescue us from our sins. Is that the system they're chasing for salvation, or are they chasing after the law? Are they chasing after? animal blood, bull and go bulls and goats for the forgiveness of sins? Are they running to the temple, right? Are they chasing after the law as a system or Jesus? Because that context really matters to us. And when Jesus is speaking to these Jewish people, he's obviously very clear on what system they're chasing after. So he starts talking about this narrow gate and this wide gate. Now, I will tell you that the legalists will try to turn this into some Christian message. You know, oh, you better watch out because you might be going through the, the, the wide gate and that's going to lead to destruction because you're messing up. And they they turn the wide gate as into some idea that, hey, if you want to get it right, the narrow gate, you've got to perform well. Well, that would be a false prophet for sure right there. They've completely taken the words of Christ and flipped them out. It's like the cops become robbers and the robbers become cops, because that's not what's going on in this. The wide gate, remember, Jewish people chasing after what? There's the law or Christ for salvation. They're Jewish people chasing after the law. So Jesus then says this, enter through the narrow gate. So the narrow gate is the one Jesus wants you to go through. 
right? For the gate, uh, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. Now, if they're chasing after Christ, is Christ going to lead them to destruction? Well, I don't think so. In fact, the law leads to destruction. Uh, Paul, the apostle Paul says that the law is a ministry of death and condemnation. Uh, we also learn in the scriptures that no one will be found right through the law. The apostle James says anyone who's under the law is under a curse. Because if you don't keep the entire law, he says, if you, if you keep all the law, but you stumble at one point, you've become guilty of it all. So it's pretty clear that the road to the, I'm sorry, the gate to destruction is the law. So he says, um, he continues then and says, and there are many who enter through it. Now, who are the many? Is this you, Christian brother, and you, Christian sister? Well, I don't think so. Who is he writing? He's writing to Jewish people. He's saying there are many of you, you guys, you're the ones I'm speaking to. You're the ones I'm talking to. And many of you all are entering through this gate that leads to destruction. It then continues, he says, for the gate, it is narrow and the way is constricted that leads to life. Who, lead, who leads to life? Jesus says, I am the light, I am the truth. He is our life, right? No one gets life except through Christ. That's how we're saved. saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I worry about someone who thinks we get life through avoiding sin, through begging and pleading for more and more forgiveness every day. And then he, he ends that with saying, and there are few who find it. Now, we know as, as much sand and as many stars, if you will, uh, the number of people who will be saved are quite a bit indeed. So why then is Jesus saying there are few who find it? Because again, he's talking to Jewish people who are not chasing after him. They're not going through that narrow gate to get to Christ. No, nope, they're going through this wide, broad gate that says, I'm going to get saved through human performance. I got the blood of bulls and goats pouring over me, taking care of my sin. We got scapegoats. We got the temple. We got a system here that we're going to go after for righteousness. It's a broad gate. And there's still a lot of people, by the way, they sound like Christians. They sound a whole lot like Christians, but they're leading us towards this broad gate gate that we do not want to go through. So now let me help you identify what these people look like today, right? Um, first of all, let's go back. What? How did he describe it? He says, beware of false prophets and do beware of them who come to you in sheep's clothing. What is he saying? They look like us. They look like brothers and sisters in Christ. They sound like us, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. Guys, they're littered in the church, I think. There's a ton of people. They can, they, they're talking, sounds like they're talking just like we are. Hey, let's go get water baptized. Hey, uh, you, you uh, sin, let's ask for God for forgiveness, even though we already have it. But yeah, sure, let, let's agree. Let's agree with God that sin is bad. Hey, let's, uh, you know, turn from our sin. Let's repent. It, we all sound a lot alike. So what's the difference in the sheep uh, the Christian and the ravenous wolf. Well, the difference is, is that they are talking about um, that as being a prerequisite for forgiveness, for salvation. So let me describe to you what they look like. Hey, it's good that you have Jesus. That's a wonderful thing. It's a good thing. But in order to be saved, you need to go and get water baptized, and then you'll be saved. Some of that same group would, uh, they're a cult, by the way, but they would then be saying, but then you got to receive a second filling of the Holy Spirit. They're adding on to the gospel. They sound and look just like us, but they're telling you, no, that's not enough to have faith in Christ. You also need to be water baptized. Now, look, we should be water baptized. It's it's an outward expression of what's already happened on the inside. I'm not saying don't get water baptized. I am most certainly 
not anti-water baptism. It, they, they sound so close, like we're saying the same thing. But the moment you attach it to salvation, you're, you're a false prophet. You're a liar. Uh, and you may look like the truth, but deep down inside, you are not indeed expressing the truth or the, or the actual gospel message. Some might say, hey, it's good you got Jesus. But, you know, each time you sin, you got to ask for forgiveness. Because if you don't, you know, you might lose that salvation. Or if you're not asking for forgiveness, maybe you were never saved. Again, sounds like the truth. But it's not true. By the way, I'm going to go out on a limb here, maybe upset a few people. You don't need to ask for what you already have as a Christian, right? He's already taking your sins away as far as the West is from the East. This lie that you are activating forgiveness over and over and over again, it's a lie. And it's a deeply distorted uh, interpretation of 1 John 1, 9. They get that whole theology from a single verse in Scripture, Right. You don't, you don't have to ask. I'm not saying don't agree. By all, if you want to ask, it's okay. But it doesn't save you. It doesn't activate your forgiveness. The blood activated your forgiveness. You're good beyond that. So the answer to you is to just believe that you have the forgiveness. And again, they sound a lot alike. And it sure does sound ominous. Hey, you got to ask. You got to ask. You got to beg and plead. Sounds religious and ominous, but it's a lie. It's a total lie. It's a sham. And it, it takes your affections and your eyes off the truth of who Christ is for you. You have been forgiven once for all. Oh, another cult says you got to speak in tongues. If you don't, if you're not speaking in tongues, that's the evidence of your salvation. Then you're not really saved. Again, this is works-based teaching. It is a lie from the evil one. And these guys will scream and kick all the way uh, through every church building and tell you, no, 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 no. I'm not saying that. But then, then if they continue to talk and you find that they are saying it. Others will say, yeah, but if you don't repent, if you don't turn from your sin, let me stop right here. I'm not. You will never find me condoning a life of sin and ungodliness. Let's absolutely avoid sin. Absolutely repent. Are you crazy? We're not made for sin. Sin is disgusting. You absolutely should be turning from it. It will never fulfill you. But the moment someone tells you, if you don't, if they connect these two dots that are not connected in the scripture, if you don't, then you could lose your salvation. Then, oh, you're the uh, once saved, always saved. Like, yeah, I am. Because my confidence is not in me and my performance. It's in Christ and his performance. So they start going down this. Yeah, if you don't repent, if you don't repent outwardly, then you're going to lose your salvation. Again, that is a liar. That person is a false prophet. And I don't honestly care who it offends. They are deeply distorted people. They want to take your eyes off of Christ. And they want you to be focusing on everything but him. And that's why they obsess with you. Now, if you notice all these things I'm pointing out, you got to get water baptized. You got to speak in tongues. You got to uh, ask for forgiveness. You got to uh, uh, stop outward sinning. Everything is about you in their context. And the gospel message, it ain't nothing about you. It's a free gift. Lest anyone boast, there's nothing you need to do. That's called workspace salvation. You're saved as a free gift given to you. So whoever will call on Jesus will not perish, but have everlasting, notice the term, everlasting, actually it's eternal life. Eternal means what? It means without an end. So again, takeaway, who are the false prophets? They look just like me. They look just like you. We all sound like we're pushing against sin and living upright godly lives. You got to look really close and you'll notice the difference is our focus is it's all about Christ and their focus is, yeah, but you also need to be performing. Sounds like you're never going to hear us say, uh, let's not perform. Well. Let's absolutely perform. We're not. The moment we detach that from being about our salvation, they think that's that's a false prophet. Like, no, the false prophet indeed is you. So be careful, folks. When people throw around the word false prophet, know that the false prophet indeed is the one who says salvation is about anything. And I do mean anything other than faith in Christ alone. As always, if you like this video, please be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and God bless you.